Hello, my name is Peter Rossing. I am professor in endocrinology at the University of Copenhagen and head of complications research at Steno Diabetes Center Copenhagen in Denmark. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk on the management of diabetes and chronic kidney disease uh, based on the recent KDGO guideline. First, these are my disclosures. I've worked with several companies in relation to clinical trials. Um, where particularly SGLT2 and GLP-1 receptor agonists are relevant to this presentation. Now, the outline of my presentation will follow the outline of the guideline, which was recently published uh, in uh, Kidney International and also available on the KDECO webpage. Uh, and that is first a chapter on comprehensive care in patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease, then uh, glycemic monitoring and targets lifestyle intervention in patients with diabetes and TKD, antihyperglycemic therapies, an area where that has really happened a lot, uh, going from antihyperglycemia to really organ protection with glucose lowering agents. And finally, approaches to management of patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. Now, when we talk about comprehensive care in patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease, it means that it's not just about treating glucose. The foundation is lifestyle intervention with exercise, smoking cessation, and dietary advice, and management of risk factors such as hyperglycemia, blood pressure, and lipids. Secondly, uh, most patients would benefit from RAS blockade, which has been recommended for many years, and now also in at least type 2 diabetes, SGLT2 inhibitors. And finally, those with very high risk for cardiovascular disease should also be given antiplatelet therapy. When we talk about blocking the renin angiotensin system with ACE inhibitors or ARPs, it's important that after this has been initiated, you monitor renal function and potassium to look for side effects. Uh, and it's also important that you aim to uh, optitrate uh, to the highest tolerated dose. Uh, and when you monitor renal function, if there's an initial drop in renal function, that's uh, expected uh, due to the reduction in interglomerular pressure. Uh, but consider if it's too large, if the patient is dehydrated or if there's uh, any other agents that could affect uh, uh, renal function, such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents or herbal medications. Also check hyperkalemia, uh, and if there's hyperkalemia, review the diet and the medication, and consider sodium bicarbonate or uh, uh, iron exchange uh, or potassium binders. The recommendation for uh, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin 2 receptor blockers have been uh, present for like 20 years and were based on the angiotensin 2 receptor blocker studies, uh, renal and IDNT testing losartan and irbesartan in type 2 diabetic patients with hypertension and proteinuria. And there was a significant risk reduction uh, in the primary endpoint of progression of kidney disease and development of end stage kidney disease uh, in both these trials. And then the recommendation was to use RAS blockade in uh, type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease. Glucose control is, of course, also important when we talk about diabetes, uh, partly to avoid uh, symptomatic hyperglycemia, but also to reduce complications. Particularly, microvascular complications are reduced. And we know from the DCCT trial in type 1 diabetes that we could obtain a 50 to 76% reduction in microvascular complications uh, by comparing uh, hemoglobin A1C of seven, uh, the intensive treated group to the standard treated group with a hemoglobin A1C of nine. In type two diabetes, the UK PDS uh, study, for instance, demonstrated a 25% reduction in microvascular complications with a reduction in hemoglobin A1C from 7.9 to seven. Um, in relation to the cardiovascular outcomes, which is what the majority of our patients are dying from, the benefit of lowering glucose uh, has been less obvious. 
how now we will show some data. Here is a meta-analysis conducted in relation to the creation of the KDGO uh, management guideline, uh, where we uh, took uh, microvascular outcome in CKD patients, uh, here both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and showing that intensive glycemic control reduced uh, progression of uh, to microalbuminuria with approximately 40%. If you look to more advanced stages of chronic kidney disease, then there was uh, in the advanced trial with uh, type 2 diabetes, there was a significant 65% reduction in end-stage kidney disease. Now, this was not a kidney trial, and not many patients reached end-stage uh, kidney disease in this trial, but there are not many studies that have elucidated the effect of uh, type glycemic control, so these data are rather rare but uh, indicates that glycemia management is also important. And if we look to cardiovascular disease, actually the meta-analysis conducted in relation to the development of the uh, CKD and diabetes guideline also demonstrated a significant 18% benefit when different trials in type 2 diabetes was meta-analysis, as you can see here. Now, considering that glycemia is important, you can ask how do you actually monitor glycemia in people with chronic kidney disease? Should we use hemoglobin A1c, glycated albumin, fructosamine, or 1,5 and hydroglucitol as a mean to measure long term glycemia? As you know, usually we use hemoglobin A1c in diabetes, but there are some issues with hemoglobin A1c. However, uh, by reviewing the literature, it became clear that hemoglobin A1c is a very good correlate with mean glucose levels, also in people with chronic kidney disease, definitely uh, in people with a GFR uh, above 30, but also in most other patients, only in uh, patients with uh, peritoneal or hemodialysis, there might be some challenges. The alternatives, glycated albumin, fructosamine, and so on, uh, are also predictors of outcome, uh, like hemoglobin A1c, but they are not very well correlated to mean glucose, and therefore we recommend hemoglobin A1c. As I mentioned, that's despite the fact that in uh, patients with chronic kidney disease, particularly when there's issues with uh, red cell turnover and anemia, uh, there might be a tendency towards hemoglobin A1c, underestimating the mean glucose level. Also, daily monitoring of glucose can be relevant, particularly if patients are treated with glucose-lowering agents like insulin or sulfonylurea that can induce hypoglycemia, whereas if people are treated with metformin or SGLT2 inhibitors or DPP4 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists that cannot induce hypoglycemia, then there's less obvious need for daily monitoring of uh, self-monitoring uh, of glucose. Now, a, a relatively new technological opportunity is continuous glucose monitoring. That can be used, for instance, to establish time in range, time in hypoglycemia, but also to establish a glucose management indicator. That's a converting factor that converted, converts mean glucose as measured with a, a continuous glucose monitor to the mean glucose based on hemoglobin A1c. So it's a way of correcting hemoglobin A1c to the individual's mean glucose level. And of course, continuous glucose monitoring can also be used in patients with high risk of hypoglycemia. These are data of how a, a report may look from uh, continuous glucose monitoring. And you can see that it measures many different uh, variables re reflecting variability in glucose, but the most used one is time in range uh, and the assessment of time uh, in, for instance, glycemia between 4 and 10 millimolars. Um, or the time below or above that range. Once you have decided how to uh, monitor glucose, you also need to set a target for glucose. But like in other patients with diabetes, it's uh, recommended to balance 
the risk for hypoglycemia with the benefit of lowering glucose in each uh, an individual patient. Now, more stringent control uh, can be obtained if you treat with agents that don't induce hypoglycemia, if it's simple uh, therapy, uh, if it's short uh, disease duration and long life expectancy, and there's no cardiovascular disease. And on the other hand, if there's history of uh, hypoglycemia, if there's a high burden of therapy, if there's a short uh, duration of uh, life, or a lot of comorbidities, you may settle for a higher glycemic target. And this is a, a scheme figure uh, in line with what you see in many other diabetes guidelines. But note that in the top, we also have added the severity of chronic kidney disease. And that is to indicate that uh, with declining renal function, the risk for hypoglycemia increases and therefore in people with advanced CKD, you should aim for a higher um, glycemic target, particularly if treating with agents that can induce hypoglycemia, of course. Other factors like cardiovascular complications, comorbidities, life expectancy, hypoglycemia awareness are, of course, also important. When we talk about uh, glucose and lifestyle management, Diet is really important. And here we recommend that patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease should uh, receive an individualized diet high in vegetables, fruits, whole grains, fibers, and legumes, and plant-based proteins, and low in processed meat, refined carbohydrates, and sweetened beverages. The figure illustrates that it's important to individualize the diet to the patient's uh, social and dietary context in order to make the patient happy with the meals he has to eat or she has to eat. In relation to protein intake, we recommend 0.8 gram per kilo per day. That's in line with the World Health Organization recommendation for everybody. Uh, and um, that is because uh, that also seems to be beneficial uh, for the kidney. Only exception is patients treated with hemodialysis uh, or peritoneal dialysis, which should consume a slightly higher protein intake because of the catabolism related to dialysis. Dietary advice also includes reduction in sodium, and there is in the guideline uh, many good suggestions on how you can cut down on sodium. And we aim for two grams of sodium per day, or five grams of sodium chloride or salt uh, uh, per day, which is also in line with the general recommendation. Then we advise that people are active and avoid a sedentary, sedentary lifestyle. And people are recommended to have 150 minutes per week of uh, acti activity uh, with moderate intensity uh, per week. And uh, I'll come back to how you can titrate this. And then finally, in, in uh, people with preserved renal function, uh, or at least above 30, then uh, uh, weight management is also advised. Concerning uh, physical activity, uh, you should assess the current level of physical activity and if patient is sedentary, well, then you should aim for a, a increased activity according to the physical uh, uh, properties of the patient. And if the patient is physically active, uh, but less than 150 minutes per week, then you should advise the patient on how to uh, increase physical activity, taking comorbid conditions into consideration. Glucose lowering medications in type 2 diabetes have been recommended uh, based on cardiovascular outcome trials. Uh, and uh, it has been recommended in here the ADA EASD guideline that if you have type 2 diabetes, uh, you should uh, consider presence of uh, cardiovascular disease or kidney disease. And if you have kidney disease, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are preferred uh, after metformin. 
and uh, then uh, a GLP-1 receptor agonist are preferred as next agent. That is because of the cardiovascular outcome trials that as a secondary outcome demonstrated kidney benefits. First, they demonstrated what was the intention with these trials, that there was a reduction in the cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, so that was three-point maze, myocardial infarction, stroke, and cardiovascular death that was reduced in these trials, but also heart failure was significantly reduced and cardiovascular uh, death was reduced in some of the trials. Furthermore, as mentioned, they had a significant impact of progression of kidney disease, as I'll come back to. Uh, after the cardiovascular outcome trials came kidney trials, and here the credence, which was the first uh, kidney trial with an SGLT2 inhibitor, showing a significant uh, reduction in the endpoint uh, development of end-stage kidney disease, doubling of creatinine, uh, or death due to cardiovascular or renal disease, and this was reduced with 30% in credence. More recently, the DAPA-CKD showing even uh, better effects, both in diabetic and non-diabetic CKD. From the credence trial, it was obvious, as in line with what was seen in the cardiovascular outcome trials, that the kidney protective effect is seen at any level of GFR. Patients were recruited with a GFR in the range from 30 to 90, and in all groups, even 30 to 45, where there's no effect on glucose, there is, as you can see, a significant benefit on the primary renal progression endpoint. There was also a benefit independent of uh, albuminuria. If you go to the cardiovascular outcome trials that are here meta-analyzed, you can see that the risk for end-stage kidney disease is also reduced here significantly here, where the credence is combined with the CLEAR, CANVAS, and IMPAREC trials, and there is a 35% reduction in end-stage kidney disease. Also, the composite kidney outcome with end-stage kidney disease or progression of kidney disease well, which was reduced with approximately 40%. And even acute kidney injury in the lower right corner was reduced with 25%, even though some people were concerned that because of the diuretic effects, you could actually increase the risk for acute kidney injury. But as I said, it is being reduced with 25%. It's important from a practical standpoint that when you start an SGLT2 inhibitor, all trials have demonstrated an initial small drop in EGFR of two to four milliliters per minute on average. That's reflecting probably the intraglomerular reduction in, in intraglomerular pressure uh, and uh, suggests that after this initial reduction, reflecting reduction in pressure, there is a much slower decline in GFR on the chronic slope, as you can see on these figures. So after one to two years, the uh, SGLT2 inhibitor treated group actually have a better preserved GFR than those treated with placebo that have a relentless decline in GFR. The Credence trial demonstrated uh, as the cardiovascular outcome trials, a cardiovascular benefit. But in Credence, it was even present in those uh, without a history of previous cardiovascular disease, but just having uh, kidney disease with macroalbuminuria was sufficient to see a cardiovascular benefit of the STLT2 inhibitor. But in addition to STLT2 inhibitors, also GLP-1 receptor agonists are beneficial in patients with CKD and they are preferred after or in addition uh, or as an alternative to SGLT2 inhibitors if they are not tolerated. They reduce also cardiovascular disease, and they're maybe even better at preventing uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. But in addition, they decrease albuminuria, uh, and in some trials, like uh, LIDA and uh, REWIND trial with laraglutide and dulaglutide, there was also a benefit on the pro progression of uh, loss of GFR. If you uh, combine the cardiovascular outcome trials uh, with GLP-1 receptor agonist and look at the kidney composite outcome that was reduced with 17% uh, driven by the less progression of macroalbuminuria, 
If you look at worsening of kidney function, that was present particularly in rewind study or in subgroups of the leader trial. Dulactotile, which was the active compound used in rewind where uh, kidney function uh, was preserved, is here tested in the AWARD-7 trial, which was a study in people with a reduced GFR on average 35 milliliters per minute at baseline. And as you can see com in comparison with insulin glargin, there was better preservation of renal function uh, with dulactotide compared to insulin. So these studies form the basis for the uh, treatment algorithm in the KDIGO guideline. The guideline says start with physical activity, nutrition, weight loss, or lifestyle therapy. Um, then for glucose control, add metformin. And as a first line uh, agent, also add an SGLT2 inhibitor, taking GFR into consideration, meaning that you need a GFR above 30 in order to initiate the SGLT2 inhibitor. If you don't tolerate uh, these agents, or if you are not at a uh, hemoglobin A1C target, you add a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an alternative agent uh, according to uh, preferences uh, as listed below. When we talk about metformin, it's important that metformin doses are often uh, needed to be reduced when GFR is below uh, 45 to 60. Um, usually you advise uh, one gram twice daily, uh, but with reduced renal function, uh, dose can be halved with 50%. And if GFR is below 30, then uh, you stop therapy. This figure from the guideline is trying to help uh, how to add uh, agents after metformin and SGLT2 inhibition depending on which uh, need you want to address. For instance, if there's a high risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, then a GLP-1 receptor agonist might be beneficial. If you're concerned of uh, hypoglycemia, then you could choose DPP-4, GLP-1, glitazones, or uh, acabose, where sulfonylurea and insulin should be avoided and so on, you can see preferences like low cost, weight loss, avoid injections, uh, or heart failure, and so on. It is also stressed in the guideline that uh, therapy should be with the patient in the focus, and patients should uh, be educated in a structured self-management educational program. This program should improve diabetes-related knowledge beliefs and skills. It should improve self-management and self-motivation. It should encourage adoption and maintenance of a healthy lifestyle, improve vascular risk factors. It should increase the patient's engagement uh, with therapy, and it should also reduce the risk for diabetes-related complications through a better understanding and better adherence to medication. But also, very importantly, of course, improve emotional well-being and treatment satisfaction uh, for the patient. This is trying to illustrate that management of diabetes requires teamwork and collaboration, and it also re requires many uh, healthcare specialists collaborating with the patient around obtaining better lifestyle adherence and better pharmacological intervention and regular screening for development of complications. In another way, uh, we should adopt a chronic care model where uh, self-management support uh, is uh, supported by delivery uh, of uh, integrated healthcare, clinical information systems and decision support systems that can help the healthcare provider provide optimal support and care for, for the patient that should create an informed and activated patient and also a prepared, proactive, multidisciplinary team. And together, they will have productive interactions that could improve outcome for patients and thereby also improve outcome for society. 
It's important, uh, as symbolized on, on this, uh, that healthcare policy makers and uh, institutional decision makers should implement team-based integrated care focused on risk evaluation and patient empowerment to provide comprehensive care in patients with diabetes and CKD. And it's trying that you have this quality circle where you assess the risk, stratify patient risk, implement therapy according to risk, and then follow up and adjust therapy in a collaboration with the patient and healthcare providers, such as nurses, dietitians, and physicians. So to summarize, the new uh, KDIGO guideline for management of diabetes and chronic kidney disease provide recommendations and practice points on comprehensive care, glycemic monitoring and targets, lifestyle interventions, antihyperglycemic therapies, approaches to management of patients, and patient-centered decision-making and support is emphasized throughout the guideline. Diet and exercise remain foundation of care, Glycemic control uh, with uh, monitoring of glycemia with hemoglobin A1C uh, and potentially going forward implementation of new technologies such as continuous glucose monitoring is also uh, recommended. Glycemic targets should be individualized with focus on the risk for hypoglycemia, which increases with declining kidney function. The longstanding Standard of care for treatment of chronic kidney disease and diabetes is an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin II receptor blocker. But these agents are underutilized in many settings still, even after 20 years of recommendations. In type 2 diabetes, then the base management should include metformin and an SGLC2 inhibitor for glucose control as well as for organ protection. With GLP-1 receptor agonist as the next preferred agent, for the cardiovascular and perhaps also kidney protective benefits of the GLP-1 receptor agonists. And finally, self-management programs and healthcare system approaches are advocated to be implemented. With this, thank you very much for your attention and a big thank you to all the uh, working group members. I was co-chairing the working group together with Ian DeBoer from Seattle in the US and the members are a diverse group, cardiologists, endocrinologists, nephrologists, general practitioners, and very important also two patients that joined the working group to make the guideline recommendations relevant and implementable also from a patient perspective. And that was, I think, very important. Thank you very much for your attention.